hey, this week we've got proof that people are listening to us. And uh, then, of course, there's the long-term support battle. Kitty Plasma 6.1 is about to come out. X Windows System is still hanging around 40 years later. Cinnamon goes 6.2. And uh, Darktable is moving away from artificial intelligence. You don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is the Untitled Linux Show, episode 157, recorded Saturday, June 22nd. Squid Game Installer. Hey folks, it is Saturday, and you know what that means. It is time for the Untitled Linux Show. Get in here, we're going to geek out about all things Linux and open source. It's going to be a lot of fun. And of course, it's not just me running the show here. We've got the whole crew in together today, and uh, some of us are getting flooded out. Some of us are baking at 100 degrees. It's uh, it's a lot of fun wherever we are across the uh, <laughs> across the world. But there's some there's some neat Linux news going on. And uh, Rob is going to kick us off. And Rob, you have it on very good authority that somebody listened to us. Well, maybe. Yeah. So last week, Jonathan shared his great idea with the world right here on the Untitled Linux show. (laughs) His idea for the framework laptop to develop a, a laptop where the SOC can be swapped out from ARM to RISC-V or whatever else uh, comes that follows that form factor. Well, here is the evidence that people are listening to us and they <laughs> responded fast. Based on this story, they heard Jonathan's idea and were like, whoa, that is an awesome idea. Why didn't we think of that? So I'm not 100% sure if this is the exact form factor Jonathan was talking about, as I'm not quite familiar with the form factor he's talking about. So I'll let him chime in at the end. But here is what is happening. Last week, I also talked about Deep Computing releasing an Ubuntu Risk Five laptop. This week, it has been announced that Deep Computing is working with Framework Computer Inc. on uh, a Risk Five mainboard. And for those out of the loop, Framework makes the famously modular framework laptop that allows you to easily swap out components so you can keep using that thing virtually forever. So of course, this new RISC-V board will drop right into any framework laptop 13 chassis uh, following the framework's modular ethos. The board will be based around the Star 5 JH7110, which uses the RV64GC instruction set architecture with a 64-bit quad-core U74 processor running at up to 1.5 gigahertz, plus an integrated GPU running up to 600 megahertz. This is the same SOC used in the Pine64 PineTab 5 tablet and in its in the Star64 single board computer. As noted last week, RISC-V is still going to be rather low performance with the, with the main intention of this is just to get RISC-V in the hands of developers so to get so they can get started developing. So so once this hardware is really ready for us, the apps will be there. And and with this framework owners will be able to just drop this into their system or or maybe purchase a used framework to drop it into. So I have two questions here for Jonathan. One, what do you think of this now? And two, since people listen to your ideas, what big idea should they announce next week? (laughs) Uh, So Rob is, of course, telling this story very, very tongue in cheek. First off, this is on the heels of last week closely enough that obviously we didn't have anything to do with it as much as we would love to (laughs) love to think that we did uh and second it's not actually quite the idea that i was pitching um but that's okay we we still we're excited to see it um the thing that's interesting about this is the the processor that they picked it is the same processor that's in the uh, the Vision 5.2, I believe is the name of the board. It's an odd name, but I think that's the name of it. Yeah. And so I'm familiar with this. I've got one of those. It's on the desk behind me or 
No, it's right here in front of me, actually. <laughs> yeah, the Star 5. It's this guy. I've got one. I had a, I've had one for a long time. And uh, yeah, so right here on it, you can see it's the JH7110. It's, it's I believe, the exact same chip. And uh, this is the first RISC chip that has come along that has hit um, a reasonable price point performance to be used useful for running Linux. It's not a great... How shall I put this? Um, it's sort of like using a Raspberry Pi, somewhere around a Raspberry Pi 4, as your main desktop. Like, it's possible, but you're not going to have the greatest time with it, as opposed to a, a really powerful desktop machine. Um, but what it is, is it is powerful enough, and kind of like what Rob said, I think he's got the idea, it's powerful enough to start compiling and start testing on. Like, it's it's a good bootstrap machine. And so, you know, as we look forward into this maybe risk risk five future, uh, things like this is a, a great stepping stone to get there. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think you'll be able to plug that uh, Vision 5 into it as it is, but... Uh... <laughs> No, no. So it's what they perform factor? What they've done is they've taken like the fr so framework has this established form factor of what their motherboards look like, mm -hmm. and the idea is that going forwards you can take their their motherboards will be replaceable. So you buy the whole laptop once, and then five years, three years, however long you want to wait down the line, they release the next motherboard. It's got the integrated chip on it. You can just pop one motherboard out and the other one back in and do an upgrade that way without having to buy a whole new laptop. Like, it's a, it's a neat idea. It's caught on. Um, and so this is something really interesting where they're offering the the new architecture. And so you could see a future where there's going to be ARM64 chips or motherboards. It's, it's full motherboards. You don't do just the chip. But with them doing this, I, I very much see a future where there's going to be ARM64 motherboards going into the framework. Uh, and then hopefully eventually, a, you know, a more powerful RISC-V chip that'll be a, a little more useful for daily computing. When they've got enough developers screaming for it, yeah. Because they'll probably be screaming after getting this one. Well, I think... I, I would hope that most people that get it know what they're going to get. Um, like, obviously, you're not going to run Windows on this thing. Uh, you're not... It's not going to be a high... You're not going to be gaming on it, really. Like, some, there's some you can do, but you're not going to be doing high-performance gaming. You're not going to be installing Steam on it. That's just totally a no-go. Um, Pong. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little <laughs> more than just Pong. So, like... Um, yeah, but we got to have the high frames per second. Yeah, you can emulate <laughs> on it. Like you could emulate probably up to like the PlayStation slash N sixty four era, no problem. Um, going past that could be you, you Atari uh, eight hundred. Oh yes, definitely, definitely all the all the frame rates for that. Um, but yeah, it's it's it, in my opinion, it's just going to be great for like bootstrapping the Risk platform. I think that's what it's going to be really important for. But you're definitely not going to be able to run KD on top of Wayland on it. Uh, you probably could. Yeah, you probably KDE's could. pretty lightweight anymore. Yeah. Um, Jeff, you want to tell us about KDE 6.1? Yes, I would love to uh, walk into that segue. <laughs> <laughs> Don't trip over it. So, so, it doesn't feel like that long ago Plasma uh, KDE Plasma 6 first appeared this year. Now, KDE Plasma 6.1 has been officially released, bringing a host of improvements. The KDE 6 series continues to evolve with added polish and new features. So while version 6 focused on correctly migrating to the underlying Qt6 framework and making sure everything, you know, the, the actual nuts and bolts were working, version 6.1 and future releases, they start going into introducing new features that go beyond basic functionality. Notably, one of these features requires Mesa 24.1 and the NVIDIA 555 graphics driver. And if you meet those requirements, you'll gain explicit GPU synchronization support for NVIDIA. So NVIDIA users, you know, it should enhance the uh, Wayland experience for Team Green, which is good news because Team Green's been needing a little help with Wayland. But, you know, we're closing the gap. Now, 6.1 also brings triple buffering. And Nate Graham was quoted as saying, Prob 
now this is his quote, probably the most impactful thing is triple buffering support for Wayland. This should make animations and screen rendering smoother in general, ideally up to the level of X11 sessions, which X11 already did triple buffering. So we're starting to get some uh, parody on some very important things here. One thing is that KDE in their release announcement says that they're really proud of, you can now start up a remote desktop directly from the system settings app. And that this means if you need to log on to a remote machine, setting up that connection is now just a few clicks. You will still need a remote desktop client such as KRDC, but it does simplify the process. Something that comes from X11 and now is coming into KDE is persistent apps. So now when you shut down your machine and say you had several, you know, say you had several windows open, Plasma will now remember what you were doing and get you back to where you were before you shut shut down the machine. Now the developers do say this is a work in progress, so it's not going to be perfect yet. So be patient with this one. Uh, some basic user functionality changes are when you go to shut down Plasma, they've simplified your options. For example, when you press shutdown, now KDE will only list shutdown and cancel, not every single power option. So for example, those who aren't running KDE, if you hit shutdown or log out, whatever it is, you have a menu that pops up and it shows shutdown, restart, you know, lock, cancel. So now it will simplify and you get specifically what you clicked on. They've added an option when locking the screen to make it behave like a traditional screensaver where you can make it not ask you for a password to unlock it. Uh, to help those with disabilities, they've added shake cursor, which makes the cursor grow when you shake it. I mean, who hasn't, you know, lost their cursor on a monster uh, monitor or multiple monitors when there's a ton of uh, windows open? And, you know, it'll make it easier for people with vision issues to find their cursor on large cluttered screens. Uh, edge barrier has been added and is useful when you have multiple monitors and you want to access things at the very edge of your monitor. So the barrier area is sticky for your cursor near the edge between the two screens and it, it basically makes it easier to click on things right at the very edge. Uh, a few other changes include updating the look of the system settings pages and several widgets got some love visually as well. So. These are just a few of the enhancements and features added to 6.1. Take a look at the show notes for a full list of changes and added features. I should note the work on 6.2 has already started, so we should see the fruits of those labors in the coming months. Right now, KDE, I think, is under an exciting development time, and really, I'm really looking forward to the future. You know, every point release is another reason to leave X behind, so I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, KDE 6.1. That's fun. Uh, you know, one of the things that they did, a lot of people got give them feedback about things that don't work in Wayland. And so now in the KDE 6 uh, kind of stream, they're working on they're, they're working on tools for artists. They're working on just like the, the, the pain points that were left for Wayland. Because KDE is, you know, one of the desktop environments that's moving full steam ahead. To the point to where I would expect before too long, it's going to be Wayland only and KDE is going to stop supporting X11. I hope not. But <laughs> right now, I've got a tumbleweed with a KDE desktop uh -huh. on X11. Though I do have the option of logging in with the Wayland version, but then I got to recreate everything again. Why do you have to recreate things? Everything should just work. Yeah. Um, I'll check next time I boot up in the Wayland session, but I was noticing that. It, I didn't have all the. Uh... You you should be able to go back and forth without yeah. even noticing a difference. Yeah, really. If I would where, say, if, if you where I noticed know... is with the uh, terminal history, it didn't seem to be there. That's very unusual. That that strikes me as a bug. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the other thing that's fun here, this is just an interesting show. Jeff is uh, taking a nap on us. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you about the alternate desktop <laughs> environment that you might be interested in. Yeah, let's talk about cinnamon. Let's let Ken take it away and give us the lowdown on cinnamon. The scoop, the scoop of cinnamon. That's like the challenge from 
boy, when I was a teenager, that's a long time ago, the Cinnamon Challenge. Anyway, Ken, take it away. <laughs> well, this time we're hearing from both Marius Nestor and Bobby Barasoff. They wrote about another desktop environment release. This time it's Cinnamon 6.2, developed by the Linux Mint team to balance functionality and resource efficiency. It introduces several enhancements aimed at improving usability and functionality. Bobby believes one standout his enhancement is Nemo's file manager. It has been upgraded with an actions organizer tool, enabling users to customize their menu actions more intuitively. Whereas Marius states other noteworthy changes to Cinnamon 6.2 are updates to the user applet to allow the displaying of profile pictures on the panel, improvements to the workspace switcher, adding shift plus click actions to the corner bar applet, fixes to the desktop peak function, and it adds a science category to the menu. Now, since I've only touched on some of the improvements, I do recommend reading Bobby and Mars, Marius's article, especially if you want to find out what Linux distro will have Cinnamon 6.2 as its default desktop and how it addresses concerns over software credibility. Hmm. So for those that don't know, Cinnamon is the desktop environment that uh, sort of forked from GNOME. It stayed with GNOME 2 when GNOME 3 went the direction of the GNOME shell. And uh, you could say they abandoned, GNOME abandoned the traditional desktop setup. Uh, when they when they went to the gnome shell, and so Cinnamon sort of uh, said, "No, no, no, we're going to we're going to stick with that idea." Um, what's interesting is apparently Cinnamon has at this point rewritten all of gnome stuff. So from what I'm seeing, there's really not any gnome code left in Cinnamon. It is now its own mm -hmm. desktop environment. Uh, it is not just GNOME 2 hanging around. I guess uh, I can't uh, give people a hard time saying they're just running old code anymore then. Yeah, it sounds like it. And uh, it is, it is of course, the flagship there for Mint. So if you're on Mint, you're probably running Cinnamon. All right. Uh, Jeff woke up from his nap. Welcome back, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was great. This the shot where you where we had you. You were like back and eyes closed and everything. It was it was outstanding. Uh, I think Jeff may be muted now, but we will get him back here in just a second. And let's see. Oh, let's talk about let's talk about a bug fix. Let's talk about a bug fix in. Uh, is this? I think it's Mesa. I think it's technically Mesa. Mesa, the kernel, Proton, somewhere in there. So this is uh, Mike Blumenkratz, who is fixing things. And uh, I, I believe this is technically going to be in Proton. Or maybe it's DXVK or GStreamer. See, all of these things are all connected together. Probably had to touch code in a bunch of places. So the problem was when you have a game that runs a video file... GStreamer is used to play the video file, and as he says, DXVK goes burr in the background. GStreamer uses GL, and he pulled this up under perf. It's a tool to do performance checking, and uh, you can see that, like, at the very beginning, before it starts doing anything, there's all kinds of processing and RAM copying going on. Um, and so he's got a he's got a, a a blog post here we linked to about what was happening, how it was less than ideal, um, and how they fixed it in in Mesa. It looks like um, he says with a few copy pasted line and a sprinkle of magical SGC dust, <laughs> the flame graph, and then he shows it in much better, much much better looking, and uh, it's like a hundred percent improvement in time in uh, code time. Uh, he was able to go, uh, let's see, his, his little benchmark went from instead of running in 13.8 seconds is now down to 9.8 seconds. So just quite an improvement. And so specifically, if you've noticed in Proton, uh, the loading and playing of pre-rendered video files is terrible. Well, in theory, it's a little less terrible now. So definitely a win. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Uh, so that one was an easy one. Rob, what about that office alternative? All right. So 
On Linux, LibreOffice is pretty much the de facto standard, but it isn't the only option. And many would argue, because I've heard them argue it, it may not even be the best option. So this past week, SoftMaker released their free office offering called FreeOffice 2024. Let me just transition for those watching so they can kind of get a peek here. So FreeOffice comes with a text editor similar to Microsoft Word, a spreadsheet editor similar to Excel, and slideshow software similar to PowerPoint. I took a first spin, and the first thing uh, when you start it up is you choose a toolbar style. And you can, you can choose a light, a dark theme, a classic, a modern. I selected a theme that uh, looked like a modern Microsoft Office as I wanted to, I wanted to see how close I could get it. And those watching can see that it looks a lot like Microsoft Office, probably much closer to Office uh, than any other options out there, except for it may be a toss up between the next one that I'm gonna mention here. But um, it's, and I think just looking like Office itself is a, a massive hurdle to clear as is just like the looks of Libre. Sometimes is it throws people off. So although I haven't been testing it long, the file compatibility with Microsoft Office seems pretty solid as well. Opening all the major Office file types such as DocX, XLSX, and PPTX. Uh, free Office is their freemium uh, to give you a taste, to get you to upgrade to one of their subscriptions or or you could purchase it outright of SoftMaker Office. But honestly, when I compared the free versus the paid versions, th there wasn't really anything that caught my attention in the paid versions that I needed. So I guess if you want to support them. And although free Office has, has word, uh, has the word free in the name it isn't open source not free as in freedom just free as in it won't cost you any money um so if you are one of the peers using uh not open office uh using only open source software on your system only office 8.1 was released this week also and i know i've showcased that one here before uh, and, and it also looks very much like Microsoft Office in its appearance. You know, and with this release, only Office includes a new app that isn't available in free Office, and that is it's it's a new PDF application suite, which can open open view PDF files and handle basic PDF editing like form filling, highlighting, simple annotations, and scribe scribing on the documents with a pen tool so it's like pokemon catch them all give all the office tools a shot see which one fits your needs the best uh, and that's really all i have to say about it i just want to do a quick for those watching quick quickly show you you know right here is their text maker here um and it looks a lot like office as you can see uh office word or microsoft word uh, what they call plan maker uh, kind of threw me a little bit at first, but that's basically like their Excel. You know, they got the ribbons. It looks a lot like it. And then they have a presentations. Um, it, it started with an S. I can't remember what the S. What I, I don't know what the S means, but that was on the logo. Uh, but it's presentations basically like PowerPoint. So there, there's plenty of alternatives to Microsoft Office. Give them a shot. Maybe one of them will, you know, cover what you're what you need. So we've looked at we've looked at only office office before and it looks pretty interesting. I I've gotta admit, I'm a little skeptical of free office. Like it just comes out of nowhere and it's not open source code and I'm not gonna run that on my machine. <laughs> They've They've had free office has been around. They haven't had a release of their free version for a few years, quite a few years, it seems like, but uh, it's not completely new, just maybe not one that gets a lot of, uh, you don't hear about often. Yeah, so apparently it's from SoftMaker, who's been yes. around since 1987, and they have been developing a word processor, the text maker, and all kinds of stuff for since then. So I suppose if they've been around that long, 
let's see, they're out of Germany, so yeah, yeah, the maybe, soft, it's, maybe it's legit. The, the pre paid one is just called soft maker um, mm -hmm. office or whatever, and I know I've heard of it. It's just it. I suppose because it's not open source, um, it, people don't talk about it as much. Makes sense. It does. All uh, right. Uh, there is a there is a new installer that might remind you of Squid. Right, Ken? Oh, um, we're not going through Jeff. Oh, ho, we have Jeff. I was, I, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> He's back. <laughs> I thought he was going to talk about my favorite windowing system. See, server. I, uh, Windows I, 11. Oh, shade, shade has been thrown. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Now that you're back, we have your audio and everything. Uh, tell us about uh, tell us about X. Well, 1984 was a pretty cool time in the computing world. Apple Macintosh arrived in the beginning of the year, and what would become the Commodore Amiga was displayed at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. While on TV, Peter Davidson turned into Colin Baker in the long-running show Doctor Who. Also in 1984, we got the first X windowing system. 40 years ago, Robert W. Schilfer, hope I said that right, brought us X. This was also one of the reasons when we talk about Wayland not having full feature compatibility, X had four decades to get where it's at. So that's a lot of time to develop something. You know, it, it, it's got a pretty good head start. Uh, the X windowing system went through a lot of versions early on, and X11 first appeared in 1987. So a lot of versions in a very short time. And X11 is where everything kind of stayed. The very latest release is X11 R7.7 or revision 7.7. .7, and that appeared 12 years ago, you know, and we're probably not going to get a 7.8. Though, there's still a few small changes that go into 7.7 .7 now and then. Before the X windowing system, there was the W windowing system, and Schilfer admitted that he stole a fair amount of code from W. So if you look at how old where X comes from, it's even older than 40 years. I mean, a lot of, a lot of its roots. You know, a high-level overview of X and greatly simplified is that it uses a client-server model and your computer is the server and the application you're running is the client. And they can both run on the same machine or different machines, so it doesn't, it, but it doesn't provide any user interface design, though. Just know there are a ton of graphical user interfaces that use X, you know, GNOME and KDE being two very big examples of that. You know, they're working hard to keep Ken happy. So if you look at the hardware architecture of machines from the early 80s until now, the hardware has changed greatly. And that's one of the reasons that X developers have stopped developing and started working on Wayland now. There are certain fundamental ways that X is structured that to make it more efficient and secure would require major hardware rewrites of large parts of X. That's where the developers decided it's better to just start from scratch. That's where they said, okay, let's, let's start this on Wayland. Now, if you're working on a Raspberry Pi, then you will know that Wayland is the display system of choice over X for, for Pis. Uh, the article in the show notes has a tagline saying, and I quote, never underestimate the stickiness of legacy technology. Now, this article is from the register and they talk about in 2022, if, if Wayland had what it takes to replace X. They go on to say two years later, the question's still open, though the direction of travel is clear. So we are heading to Wayland. They talk, but they do talk about the stickiness of it just works is not to be underestimated. And they would not be surprised if for the 50th anniversary rolls around, there's still someone clinging to X for that one old app that won't run properly on anything else. And, but, you know, we'll, time, time will tell. I would love to know your thoughts on this. And, you know, you can always uh, drop us a line on the Discord as well. So, I've just gone down a rabbit hole, and I think everyone will enjoy it. Um, ironically, it's another article from Lunduke, who is, again, the Linux sucks guy. Um, but he is, uh, apparently, he has discovered that there is... There is no copies of the W Windows system anywhere on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> he went don't, looking. You don't need copies of it. A fair amount of the codes uh, is in X. 
Well, it, it was, but that doesn't help if you want to actually run W and see what it looked like. And so he, he went looking for, you know, anything, a screenshot, the original code to be able to try to run it, any of that. And uh, comes comes to some interesting stuff. Apparently, there was yeah. a... There was a W window system from the 1990s, and you can find screenshots of that. It looks very uh, Mac-esque, you know, from that same time period. Not the same thing. And then he's got one screenshot from a Vax Station 100. And it's like, maybe this is what we're looking for. Um, but it's it's just kind of an open-ended mystery. So throw that, throw that uh, link in the show notes because I found that very fascinating. And uh, maybe one of these days somebody will find a copy of it, and and we can get one of the uh, one of the great you know retro computer YouTubers to to set it up on their homebrew system or something. I think, and I've uh, got just uh, the thing to help you with the installing it. Oh, what's that? Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> the the Squid Game installer. Well, I I would say though before we segue is that that one will be tough because if you think okay this was an eighty four he copied the code before that, so it would probably exist on tape or Mm -hmm. something like that and then back then you know the internet was like universities and governments so it wasn't oh here's a big open source everything and everybody's sharing it would be in some locked cabinet somewhere it wasn't called internet it was called sneaker net well it was they they had the arpa net Sneakernet was taking the tapes and walking them where you were going <laughs> yeah, using your I was sneakers. a little older. Well, I think they I thought the internet was like the 70s and then before that is when it was ARPANET. Um, no, it's around the 70s and 80s was ARPANET. Uh, 1969 when, when and ARPANET was decommissioned in 1989. Oh. Uh, and when it became the internet, which is essentially when it was opened up to the public. Um, that one, I'm not sure. It looks like that early... 92? 91? Mm, no, it would have had to have been before that, I believe. Yeah, That's I when remember. Al Gore created the World Wide Web. Yeah. I That's... remember being on the internet in like 91. But it was like, everybody had a .edu uh, mail address, and, no, and, it, and the mail. language was either German or English. That was that was pretty much the language of the internet back then. Yeah, um, I will find that out. We'll we will go to the next story, and I will find out when the internet was opened. It looks like it's early '80s, but I'll do a little more research. We're gonna let Ken finally talk about the Squid Installer. <laughs> it's my <laughs> like third or fourth time to try that segue. <laughs> and yes. We're hearing from Bobby Borisov, since he's the one who reported, about the Calamaris team officially releasing version 3.3.7 of their popular distro agnostic Linux installation framework. Here are some of the new features in Calamaris installer 3.3.7. It comes with enhanced code formatting and standards, advanced command line or command list capabilities, module improvements and bug fixes to include file system table or F's tab module, partition module tweaks, various QT related fixes, and preventing sleep and suspend during installation. I always hated it when I'd walk away and come back 30 minutes later to see how far it is to find out it hadn't gotten anywhere because it's suspended. Yes. Well, you, Bobby's article does include a link to release notes for Calamaris Installer 3.3.7. I do recommend reading the release to see what this release is, just to see who the, this release's contributors are. Yeah, interesting. I, I, must, I must agree. I, I definitely get annoyed. One of the other times is uh, the Fedora Live CD. The Fedora Live DVD, for whatever reason, has uh, suspend or, or, yeah, suspend turned on. And so you start something like uh, trying to rescue a disc and it suspends partway through. It's not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to start all over again. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, let's move along. And uh, 
we're going to talk about AI. I think I'm up next. I don't know. I'm a little discombobulated today, but I'm pretty sure it's my turn. And we're going to talk about AI. In fact, uh, we're going to talk about AI not being everything it's cracked up to be in this particular case. And so the story is from Pharonix, and it's Darktable 4.8. Darktable, of course, is a piece of open source software that is essentially for photo editing, not in the way that Photoshop is, but more like uh, adjusting your white balance, taking your raws and turning them into your final photos, um, things like that. And Darktable had some artificial intelligence to do some of those things automatically. You know, here's my picture. Please, AI, pick the right white balance settings for me. Um, <laughs> and come to find out those weren't working anywhere near the way that they were supposed to. And so with Darktable 4.8, the AI features have been, well, they've not been entirely removed. From what I've found looking through the bug reports, they've just been hidden, which is a, a, a nice way of saying that they were really terrible and they didn't work, so we're not going to expose them for people. Um, I'm, just, I'm just fascinated by this. There's not a whole lot of meat here. I'm just fascinated by this. AI is changing the world, and yet, you know, in, in another time another example of the shininess has worn off and maybe it wasn't quite as great as we thought it was ai almost incompetent yeah. <laughs> almost. Or like Preppy says apple yeah. intelligence <laughs> oh yeah. almost yeah, incompetent. It, uh, that's yeah, that's pretty good apple's interest well not in this case apple didn't have anything to do with dark table but uh, uh say, biggest place thankfully. i use dark table is uh uh digicam hmm he yeah, does a lot sense. of a lot of photo type stuff, and they have dark table in there, and yeah. So you can. I I find AI to be excellent in some circumstances. Some Not circumstances. like Windows Recal. I, I recall. I don't. I don't <laughs> want things like that. But I think that it has its use case. I That's still fair. prefer okay. ML. The machine learning over artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. You know the one thing. Side note here. I know it's Linux, but the the recall. You know, I can search for an email that I in Outlook from three days ago, and I know who sent it, and I can't find it till I look <laughs> some other way. I mean, how is that? They can't make simple email search work. How the heck are they going to make recall work? Well, recall was like, going to be the solution. Recall was the answer to that. That's where they need to put the AI, just in the search. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's still not going to find it. It's like, <laughs> you know. Uh, I know. I hear you. If Hell they yeah. put A and I in search, you're gonna be we're gonna be mispronouncing it. <laughs> That's not how you spell that. Uh, all right, I, let's move. You better hear on. what Rob's got got to say. <laughs> uh, the LTS battle. Oh, long-term support. Yes. Yes. There's some interesting a... things going on in this space right now. Wouldn't wouldn't happen to be related to uh, the 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 final dropping of support for Rel Seven, would it? It wouldn't, but I will let you follow up with that if you, if you <laughs> okay. want. Okay, I think uh, it may uh, be related. I bet you it's actually it, secretly related. There there is some relation to it, but uh, there there's a lot of content here without that. But um, yeah, so the, there besides that whole uh, dropping of that. Uh, there is a major long-term support battle going on, and we, we we haven't been paying attention, I guess. You know, distros, they've kind of gone back and forth with uh, their LTS support, long-term uh, support. You know, three years, it's not really long-term, but three years is pretty common. Five years for some long-term, six years. And then, it you know, it wasn't that long ago that Red Hat and Canonical you know, with Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Canonical's Ubuntu went to 10 years of support. And then recently, you know, it wasn't long after 10 years, they went to 12 years of support. For the past few years, there has been a clear battle between RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and Ubuntu to have the longest support cycle. Well, we have a new contender in the ring. And they, they, they've, they've always been there, but you know, maybe like free office, nobody seems to talk about them much. But maybe, maybe this will get people talking. As we record this today, the year is 2024. And SUSE this week has announced that 
their uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise 15 will be supported until the year 2037. That is 13 years from now. But that alone is, it's, you know, sure, it's more than Red Hat or Canonical's 12 years of support by one year, except that SUSE Linux in, uh, Enterprise 15 was released on July 16th. 2018 that makes a total of 19 years of support so if i switch my servers to susa um you know in in 2036 i could be running php 7 or something like that while the rest of the world is like on php 15 <laughs> i don't know whatever i don't know what's gonna happen uh, who knows where i'll be at in in that many years it's a long ways away so in, in now that uh you know that's just insane. I, I can't even imagine the same distro version for 12 years. And I'll let alone 19. I'm three years is a bounty usually, and I'm upgrading, except for that one server I've mentioned a few times. I had one on one that was well past its prime. But I'm done with that. I, I'm upgraded. So anyway, why are they doing this? Well, to beat Red Hat and Canonical, of course. Uh, that isn't exactly the reasons they provided. But uh, SUSE, general manager of business critical Linux, Rick Spencer, explained in an interview that the reason is that on Tuesday, January 19th, 2038, we reach the end of computing time. So, you know, might as well in support there too, right? Okay, not really, it's not in the computer time, exactly. For those who don't know, when computer time, you know, it's, it's just a number that ticks all the way up from zero. When it was first created, it started January 1st, 1970, and it had a four byte integer, which only had enough space to get to January 19th, 2038. So, you know, much like the Y2K bug, um, this has already been fixed in modern systems and shouldn't be a problem, but it could have been. And who knows, maybe there's going to be a system that hits. But anyway, the Y2038 bug was fixed in Linux kernel 5.6 with SLE, uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise, uh, doesn't have a, a Y2830 kernel until their service pack for. So for SLE 15, they have, different service packs throughout the years. So it wasn't until service pack four that, that was released in 2022 that they actually had the Y2038 bug fix. So if they're gonna support the initial release of SUSE 15 as long as possible, it, it just literally can't be supported past 2037, um, you know, not not in its original form because your time's gonna break and who knows what's gonna happen i into the world i don't know so anyway that's a long time to support a system i don't really know why they're doing it they didn't really give a good reason it, the only thing they gave is a reason why not to support it any longer so i don't know what's gonna happen after the next version they're gonna just support it forever i don't know what what LTS? Who's who's going to try to beat that? Which LTS is going to beat it next? <laughs> so, uh, nineteen years ago was two thousand five. Can you imagine still running Linux from two thousand five? Do you remember what Linux was like in two thousand five? It. I mean, I it used hurt. it. <laughs> <laughs> we we used it, but man, it was it was it was pretty bad in comparison to what we have these days. I was like Fedora core four or five for me, which worked. It was great, but mm, I don't want to go back to those days. I don't want to yeah. still be running it. A lot of yeah, it's going to be so much better. And, yeah. It's going to be so much better by, you know, the 2030s that why do you still want to run something from 2018? But yeah, no. there's those systems that, you know, like my old PHP server that uh, had some old code that was, too much work to update. <laughs> yep. So yeah, I, here, here's my question for everybody, including those in the audience. Who's still running an 8 bit computer system? Probably you. <laughs> an emulate, via an emulator, yeah. I still uh, have my Commodore 64 and my 
Atari twenty six hundred. So those <laughs> ran the what the the sixty eight oh two sixty five oh two. 6502, yeah. Uh, apparently the 6502... Which is still a great is, chip. It's still in use for various things. Yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, okay. so so Jonathan was hinting at something about CentOS 7 end of life. And does anybody want to try to pick that up real quick here? or? Oh, sure. So Suze has uh, Liberty Linux, Liberty Linux Lite, which is essentially their option for if you're on CentOS 7 and it just end of life and or it's about to i guess june 30th is the the deadline for that uh you can switch over to liberty linux now it's uh, actually not you're not switching over you're purchasing a subscription yes so liberty linux that gives was, you provides you service for that centos 7. Yeah, but you so, do uh, have sovereign. to switch over your repositories yes so there's a switch that happens i was getting there yes it's not free <laughs> Uh, it is, in fact, it looks like it's $199 for one machine or, year, I think. uh, is that per year? No, that's three years. Remember. That's three a three years. year. So, right. It, I mean, if you, if you really need it, that's not terrible that much. It's not that terribly expensive, honestly. Um, but yeah, if you have a whole bunch of machines, it gets expensive. I mean, it couple of things on that though. I mean, people using CentOS, are you using it because they <laughs> don't want to pay for it so that's there's sometimes that. true that's sometimes true not always. otherwise they could be using rel um and there was another point i'll, I'll think of it <laughs> <laughs> i don't know um, i mean to me the whole the whole thing you know support these super long-term supports it's it's the equivalent of you know the redneck hold my beer. It's like you know a bunch of programmers <laughs> like woohoo we're partying and like hey watch this hold my code you know <laughs> oh yeah so so Liberty Linux what I read is it's not exactly new I don't think I think it's, it's been around it's been around yeah but they're just providing an upgrade or maybe not upgrade path a transition path to mm -hmm. to to seamlessly have your CentOS get its updates from Liberty Linux rather than from the CentOS 7 repositories that are going to go away soon. Yeah, there not is be updated. There is a tool. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the tool. It's either Alma Linux or Rocky uh, developed it. Um, I think it was Alma. Yeah, I think it is Alma Linux. What is the name of that tool? Uh, bu -bu -bu -bum. There's a uh, Leap, Leap Upgrade, L-E-A-P-P. -P. That might be it. Anyway, that is a great tool for switching between your upstream, you know, going to Rocky, going to Alma. Um, but it also has really good support for bumping versions. So like going from seven to eight or eight to nine. Um, so if if you're in this situation and you're still running uh, since was seven and it's about to be at time, uh, I believe Leap is the tool that I was thinking of. And yeah, it's uh, it's. It's pretty nifty. It's it's something to look at for sure. So anyway, let's move on. We've got we've got more to cover. Uh, Jeff Firefox Firefox one twenty eight a uh, a notable number. It's a two to the power of. It is, and you know there's a few of us out there that really love the Firefox browser, and luckily for us, it continues to be developed, and. Example of that is Firefox 128 enters beta testing. And one of the biggest features it's coming with is a revamp to the dia dialog box for clearing user data. Now, if you use Chrome, that dialog box is going to look very familiar because it's going to give you the ability to clean data from a specific period of time. For example, the last hour, two hours, last four hours, and so on. And it will also give you insights into the size of the data it will be clearing in that time frame you've selected. So you might pick a time frame and it'll tell you, oh, you've got, you know, 30 megs worth of stuff it's gonna clean out. And so you can select exactly what you wanna uh, clean and when, and it, just more granularity and control over uh, keeping your uh, security, keeping the browser locked down a little more. Mm -hmm. Uh, 128 will also bring the ability to play protected content from streaming sites like Netflix in the private browsing mode. So now if you're in a private window, you'll still you'll be able to play uh, Netflix or other other type of protected content uh, without uh, fear. They've added support for 
proxying DNS by default when using SOX v5 to avoid leaking DNS queries to the network. So that's that's good. A little more uh, security there. More text line inline file types are now supported. So definitely good there. Web developers get some love as well. They pro they promise support for the at property and the CSS properties and values API. There are now resizable array buffers and growable shared array buffers in SpiderMonkey, basically so you can change the size of an array buffer without having to create a new one and then copy the data into it. So you can just adjust it on the fly without all the data transfer. Uh, Firefox 128 now, or also now is better lines with the fetch standard and other browsers. So it's, it's, it's aligning itself to uh, industry standards. There are other updates that I haven't gone over, but if you take a look at the article in the show notes, there's links to the official testing site. And I should note that although we've talked about this before, certain features still have not made it into 128. So future uh, versions will have things like uh, trending search suggestions and the cookie banner blocker feature. So that'll be in the privacy and security settings. So they're, they're coming, they're being worked on, they just haven't made it into this beta test. So look, look for it in 129, maybe 130. And uh, maybe it's time to give Firefox a little love and try it out again. And you know, if you, if you have it for a while, maybe, maybe you'll wanna give it, uh, give it a little love and you wanna switch, switch back, you know. Personally, I'm okay without Chrome. So, yeah, what Firefox notably does not have is the uh, the the new uh, Chrome manifest that is breaking some uh, <laughs> breaking some plugins over on Chrome's side. Although I looked into that, and it doesn't break them as bad as I expected it to. There's <laughs> there's a few issues, but it's not quite the uh, nuclear meltdown that uh, people people sort of act like it is. So. I'm yeah. holding off yeah. uh, to move to Firefox, moving back to Firefox as my main until they get some sense and uh, put a progressive web app uh, uh, mm -hmm. functionality back in. I see. You know, I think I think with Firefox, part of the deal is they have limited resources right now. And so there's a whole bunch of things that they would love to do and people would love for them to do. But it just takes money to hire programmers to be able to do it. So kind of kind of stuck there but i bet you, that they take your contributions rob oh that's true that is absolutely how true. else are they going to pay their ceo <laughs> <laughs> well you know <laughs> <laughs> all right so there was an interesting tidbit of news this past week and uh, i saw it and apparently ken saw it too and that is linux 611 is going monochrome what is up with that, Ken? Yes, well, Pharonix's Michael Larabell wrote about several graphics-related kernel patches coming from Raspberry Pi developers this week. First, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, is a new user space API change to the direct rendering manager subsystem with Linux 6.11 that's adding a new monochrome TV mode variant. It's the DRM underscore mode underscore TV underscore mode underscore monochrome. Now it's for representing video with no color encoding or burst and no pedestal. Now the second story that I got in the show notes is about Raspberry Pi engineers who have also begun the trek toward upstreaming their kernel graphics driver support. Dave Stevenson of the Raspberry Pi crew sent out a set of preparatory patches for the Broadcom BCM2712 system on a chip support as used by the Raspberry Pi 5. The Raspberry Pi engineers have submitted a set of 31 patches for various fixes they have been carrying in their downstream kernel for a while. These patches also make some infrastructure improvements that will help facilitate their um, streaming of the uh, system on the chip support that they've got. The BCM2712 is the 16 nanometer application processor that's at the heart of the Raspberry Pi 5 that integrates an improved 12 core video core V7 GPU, 
a hardware video scaler and HDMI controller capable of driving dual 4K 60 frames per second displays. I also echo Michael's hoping more of the Raspberry Pi 5 support will be upstream before this board celebrates its first birthday. For more details about each of these patches, I do recommend reading both articles by Michael, especially if you want to find out how many lines of code in the CV4 driver are touched by some of these patches. Yeah, Jonathan, still, you want to take a guess at that? Uh, it's, it's a bunch. Um, though, so if, if you mean just the... Uh, the VC4 driver, that's actually not very many because it's like building on things that are already there. Um, but the full-on support is going to be a bunch of code, I'm sure. Uh, I'm I'm really fascinated by the, uh, the monochrome stuff, and I have an idea as to what this is about. So the first thing is, you got to remember, on the older Raspberry Pi boards, they had composite video out that's like the, the the single it's usually yellow rca cable and so on old tvs you can just do video out over that um and i'm imagining that what this is is for supporting rca out for really 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 old tvs like places where people still have black and white TVs and huh. their signal did not work properly. And somebody sent in a bug report and said, this really ought to work because there are places where we still have black and white TVs. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just humored by this, by this idea of, you know, like kids trying to program on their raspberry pies and trying to use it on their black and white TV. It's, it's, it harkens back to my childhood of, you know, visiting my grandparents and trying to play the old Atari 2600 on their, their spare black and white TV. <laughs> I briefly had a black and white TV when uh in in the eighties and it was had an Atari hooked up to it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a it is a common experience. But come I, that they even work anymore? I mean, come oh. on. All right. Send in your comments to the show if you are still using or even have a black and white TV. I'd love to hear. Well, not necessarily a black or white, but maybe one of those the monochrome, monochrome monitors. monitors that had like a, a green the, cast to it. Yeah. I had them at or least the in the early 2000s. I still had some of them around. Yeah, that's true. Some of the early computer monitors were monochrome as well. So maybe actually, supporting those. Actually, I, I still had them around like five years ago, and I finally got rid of them. But <laughs> seems like that that's like about a, like a what VT100 mode or something, mm, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I still I still would love to be able to get my hands on one of those, by the way, but that's a different story. Uh, yeah, fascinating stuff with the uh, with the Raspberry Pi. OK, we got one more story to cover. And this one is this one is interesting. This one is a callback to something we talked about last week. It's about Kaspersky. And so hmm. Kaspersky, of course, has released that fancy new scanner, a virus scanner for Linux, the free thing to find malware on your Linux machine. And we were going back and forth whether, you know, it was a good idea to ever run one of to, to run that software. And I came up with the idea of, well, you, you clone to a virtual machine, you run it in a virtual machine, then you delete the whole thing. That way you, you get to see if it finds anything, but you also don't have to trust any Kaspersky code. Well, I was apparently not the only one thinking about maybe it wasn't a great idea to trust Kaspersky code because the uh, U.S. government has come out and banned the usage of anything Kaspersky in the United States. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they're officially now on the list, the, the no-no list. You are not allowed to use Kaspersky antivirus. Um, it, it, okay, it's humorous. Um, I In the show notes, I've got a link off to Troy, Troy Hunt's take on this, and I very much agree with what he has to say. His take is, I'm sympathetic to the individuals working at Kaspersky that are caught up in the political quagmire. And I've got to agree with that. Like There are, there are some great programmers at Kaspersky. Some great security research comes out of Kaspersky. And I, too, I... It is unfortunate that this is a thing that we've had to come to. Um, at the same time, I absolutely understand why it would be considered a bad idea. We talked about it last week, why it would be a bad idea for U.S. businesses and particularly U.S. government places to run Kaspersky code. Like there's just a, a kind of an inherent uh, potential for the conflict of interest. Now, the other side of that, um, 
you know, national security letters are a thing in the United States. And so if you're outside the United States, there's a bit of foolhardiness to running software made by U.S. companies. Um, so, I mean, that's a that's a blade that cuts both ways for what it's worth. Um, anyway, that's uh, I, I don't have a I don't have a much deeper take on it than that. I'm curious if you guys have anything. Uh, and, and one other thing I'm curious about, does this mean that we legally can't go and grab the Kaspersky scanner now? Are we committing? Are we committing crime to go and get the Kaspersky link scanner? Yeah, who's uh, who's accountable for that? But well, it uh, depends on where you physically are when you download it. Yeah, I suppose that's true. But I mean, coming back in the United States, yeah. but so like, if you go to your undisclosed Caribbean country, and you put it on your laptop, and but then you come back into the United States with it on your laptop, are you then committing a crime? Like, that's not the kind of crime that you want to commit. That's mm, you get it. You get a visit from the wrong people for committing <laughs> that sort of crime. Would that be considered trafficking? Uh something like that. <laughs> so, so, a Mega Man uh, in the Discord did ask a good question. Which is one I, I kind of said in a back chat a few days ago, and 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 he says I thought, uh, well he, he thought the government already banned Kaspersky back Kaspersky back in 2017. Uh, he remembered having to dump it on all of all of his clients, and the government did ban it for government use. So so, <laughs> as I answered the Discord, but. And as, as someone responded to me earlier this week, uh, governments basically banned it so nobody working in the federal government could so if use you had it. A, and now, now it's banned for everyone in the U.S. Yeah. So if you had a contract with the government, you were required to remove it if you did have it. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I'm yeah, sure so they, you, they wrote a, you know, they wrote a FAR rule, the, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, which... If you haven't ever had to work with FAR and and I forget what the other one is, be glad. Oh, those are some of the the worst, most dense documents that uh, I had to do that once. No, thank you. But I'm sure there was a FAR rule added for that for Kaspersky. They got their own rule in the FAR, and so you know you get a government uh, a government contract, and it'll just have lists and lists and lists of FAR rules. Uh, you know, like pages and pages of this contract falls under FAR rule two seven three dash two five dash seven, and you got to go look it up print it out and make sure you understand what it says so it, there was one of those for that's where you need an ai for summarizing is that uh new kaspersky app was that free or was that something you had to pay for because i'm wondering free. if this just it was free mm -hmm. yeah so I was, I, I was wondering if it was just like things were going to block it so you couldn't actually purchase it but if it's free i mean that's that's hard to block I and mean, we don't have the uh great firewall of america to my knowledge but uh uh, I kind of want to get it now, just just because. <laughs> I would no seriously, seriously, Rob. I would be I would be very careful about doing that, um, because this is the sort of thing that agencies do not have much of a sense of humor over. I mean, and this the, the it, general this public, will, the general public doesn't know this though either. So I mean, people are gonna get it, and and. Well, and unless they're actually blocking it, I would imagine that ISPs will be forced to block it. Which Honestly. means that I, I thought it was like you could get it, but they would block like, or if you had it, like for example, it would block all updates. And it sounded like they were. Right. They did say that shutting down access to it. Yeah, I, I but think see, it's. I think they're going to try to make it difficult to get to it. Yeah, from from but, what I read, it, well, it did say updates. So if you had it already installed, it 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 was going to become useless. Yeah, see, Rob didn't even want it till you told him he couldn't have it. <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I like, I like the what was said once where it was like, well, is it because it's leaking information and stuff, or is it because it's too good at finding like the NSA's programs and? <laughs> uh, not, none of none of the above. Okay, so we should we should you're right. We should chat about that real quick. Why why this is a thing? Um, I I made allusion to it, but you're, we should make this explicit. Uh, the danger is so Kaspersky is made by a company that is in Russia. They are, I think, in Moscow is where they're headquartered. The danger is that similarly to the way that the United States occasionally does things, we over here we call it a national security letter. And you can go, you can go look at the Snowden revelations to see some of how that works. The danger is that in Russia they have the exact same sort of mechanism. The Russian government, you know, they're they're 
I, I forget, you know, what, what they call their equivalent of the NSA, but they will come to a company and they could come to Kaspersky and say, hey, when you ship that update to, you know, the little mom and pop business in the United States, th- this particular business is the one we're interested in. When you ship that next update, we want you to put this code in there as well. And because Kaspersky is a Russian company, they do not have a whole lot of option other than to do as they're told um it's it's the same reason why in the united states we are blocked from using uh hawaii uh the the chinese company so their hardware it's the exact same thought that the chinese government could come to that company and say hey when you ship off that you know that cellular modem that's going to go in the united states we need you to put this extra little bit of code in there and not tell anybody about it and so that's the danger um that is a legitimate concern uh whether it's whether the response here is appropriate or not is a much deeper discussion but like that's the concern that's the reason why they are why the united states government is doing this um and we did we did joke in the back chat that uh, maybe this means that if you're looking for nsa written malware kaspersky is the way to go um and that's (laughs) About 50-50 between a joke and serious. <laughs> <laughs> well, who, who better to detect it than... Uh, exactly. Probably Russia or China. You know? Exactly. Uh, but, there, but there is... And, and, but to go back there, there is a lot of that stuff that really gets taken serious because like even dealing with Huawei, there's a lot of... Even to sell hardware to them, there's a whole lot of hoops to jump through and what you can do and what you can't do. And it's... Mm-hmm. It's scrutinized not only by what goes out from like our government, but what goes in by, for example, the Chinese government Mm -hmm. and to make sure that it's, you know, is it the chip really what it says or is there any little added backdoor or something in it? And it, it's, it's a lot, a lot of these governments take it really well. I mean, they do take it really seriously and it creates a lot of paperwork and scrutiny and yeah. So if, if you, uh, if you think this is all overblown and no government would ever do this, I would recommend going to Hackaday and reading my coverage on Project Rubicon. That was something. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave that little tidbit there. And that was yeah. us? Uh, that uh, Project Rubicon was us. Yes, working with US. the... Uh, <laughs> us. Uh, yes. I can yes. still get to the Kaspersky website. In fact, they have a usa.kaspersky.com, so... <laughs> I'm just, and and I'm they just ask saying, for donations. They ask for I'm donations just saying, too. <laughs> before you do anything with Kaspersky, go read the new regulations and wrap your mind around what exactly it says you can and cannot do. Because I, I would not want to be found to have intentionally uh, <laughs> disobeyed that. That uh, yeah, that could be a big deal. Um, I honestly, I imagine this will probably end up as a Supreme Court ruling one day, where Kaspersky or some other company says, "Well, this is a," and who knows. It's a First Amendment violation. That people can't run what software they want to on their computer. Like, right, who, along with TikTok. Who knows? Those, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, yeah. Rob, how are you going to tile those walls? <laughs> well, <laughs> if we're ready to move on, I will show you how. But. <laughs> that took that took me too long to figure out that segue. All right, so that is the news. Let's move into some tips. They're not all command line tips, of course, because we're running out of command line tips. There's only so many things you can do on the command line. Uh, and Rob's going to take it away and tell us about, apparently, how to tile the shell. Yeah, so since we've told you every command in Linux already, we're moving to some GUI stuff. So what I am going to show you here is... I'm sorry, Katie users, users, this, you guys already have some decent tiling. This is for GNOME users because you have to use extensions to, to make it do what you want. But I, I came across this extension and it is the tiling shell uh, extension for GNOME. And I thought it was pretty awesome. It works pretty slick. So let me just transition over so you guys can see my screen and hold on there we go let's get the right screen there so i'll use these again here so i have the tiling windows the tiling shell extension which you can get from gnome extensions have it installed uh you can edit uh the um the tiling layouts as you want and i have done some for my personal preference but so 
on the screen. For those watching, you can just uh, click, drag the one you want. If you drag it to the top, this nice little drop down of, of the ones you have will appear, the, the layouts you have. And you guys drop it right in there. Drop that one in there. Or while you're holding, if you hit control or hold control, it's going to kind of show up on your screen and you can drag it to whichever section you want. Now, when you hit control, I believe it just only shows the first option you have. Otherwise, you can, you know, do however you want. If you want to do a new layout, it's pretty easy. Left click to split a tile, left click plus control to split it vertically. Um, and you can just put those however you want. I don't want to uh, do any more right now, so I'm going to cancel that. Uh, another thing, when you if you already have them laid out, you know, if I got these guys laid out where I want them, and then I manually decide to drag it a little different, it's going to basically adjust all your tiling there. So it is just a nice, uh, nice tiling extension for GNOME. I really like it. It's pretty slick for me, for my uses. Cool. Tiling Omega is one of those... Man. Good. Oh, well, I was gonna say Omega Man fifty five is asking, uh, can you use the arrow keys to move the windows? Can I move the arrow keys? I don't think so. But there's probably a shortcut to do it. There might be. I'm not aware of it yet. Most uh, most of those tiling shells will have their own like keyboard shortcuts to get in and, and manipulate things. There was yeah. a bunch of settings. I just came across it this week. But uh... yep, yep. Uh, the tiling, my experience, tiling works better on the big monitors. You have a little, like a little laptop monitor. It's like you oh, don't yeah. need to tile that. It's it, it's <laughs> too small already. <laughs> yeah, indeed. All right, Jeff. Let's talk about Fuser. Is this the uh, the the way to build a nuclear fusion reactor on your desktop? That that kind of Fuser. Uh, no, no, no comment, comrade. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I will say, you know, I'm, I'm back after a couple of weeks and this is a command line tip. So, yeah. I want to be proud of that because Jonathan, Jonathan teases me when I don't have command line tips. I just have tips. <laughs> anyway, so my command line tip for the week is called Fuser and it's actually short for file user and its use can be a little complicated, but it's very simple to explain. And the really short version is, it's a command line utility used to identify the processes that are currently using a file, a directory, a socket, or a file system. So the link in the show notes goes into great deal about how you use it and different options it supports. I'm not going to go into the, all the, the details about it because it's, it's too long to go into for just a little command line segment. But some basic uses would be like identifying a process using a file. So I'm sure some of it, or a lot of us have tried to delete a file and you get an error saying that's in use. Well, maybe you don't know the program that has the file open. But now with Fuser, you can find out which program has it open. The same thing goes for a network socket, you know, directory, any of that. And you can even use Fuser to kill the process that's using a file or socket. Now, an example, a simple example of using it would be Fuser space dash V for, for, for verbose space and then the path to a file. In my case, I did it with a file in my show notes and it gave me, you know, the user information. So it had, had my name, process ID, access to the file. So it tells you, is it, you know, opened, reading, what, what's, it, what's it doing? and what command is using the file. So I could see what text editor I had that was accessing the file. Now, if you wanted to find out who's using the current directory, it would be fuser, F-U-S-E-R, space, dash V, space, period, for the current directory. Now, in my case, it gave me a small list of different programs all under myself because I was in my home directory. But that way you can track, you know, if you're trying to delete a directory, you know, file system, whatever it is, this will help you get to the root of it and not have to just go, oh, the heck with it. I'm just going to reboot and then, you know, clear everything and then uh, delete. So take a look at the show notes and see the other switches that are supported. And I, you know, always love to hear from the Discord if adding this to your toolbox would be helpful. I know the times in the, there's times in the past I've needed it and it would have helped me out a lot. So 
give it give it a look yeah i like it i i have historically had to use uh, lsof and then grew up through it um this is a, this is a nifty way to do it I like it. I will definitely add it to my toolbox. I can't tell you how many times I go looking for how to do something and I find myself back at our master list of all the <laughs> command line tips that we've ever given. That thing is great. Uh, uh, guilty on that, too. Yeah, yeah, a lot, <laughs> quite often. All right, Ken, what you got for us? Well, I've got a command line t- tip for a command that we have not covered yet for the command line. It's in process. This isn't one of, another one of those core util commands that I've covered in the past mm-hmm. um, that I recently used when checking out my new system. As I said, it's in P-R-O-C, in Prox, how I pronounce it. It's for printing or displaying the number of available or installed processors. Now, in the show note, I've got a link to a demo document where I've gone through on the systems I have to demonstrate checking, like for example, when you when you open the document, you'll see the first screenshot is for my uh, Lenovo Think Center A63. And I first ran NeoFit, so you can see what kind of uh, processor it is. That one's got the AMD Athlon 2 dual core processor, and you'll see in the screenshot that Improc comes back with the number two. And it goes on down and shows that you have the uh, screenshot for my uh, ASUS Chromebook, which has an Intel i3 quad-core CPU in it. And you'll see that it also has reports four cores. Then my son last October gave me... uh, Lenovo ThinkPad, a L560 laptop, which had an Intel i5 quad-core CPU. And then you'll see a screenshot I took of my latest machine, the uh, a- which has an AMD Ryzen 7 7700 8-core CPU. And as you see, Jonathan's got my... Uh, terminal up i'm going to show you how i can double those eight cores today <laughs> i'm going to run neo fetch again and if you look where it says cpu you'll see it says 16 and i type in proc dash a to count all ah, just go in and you'll see that report 16. That's because I've got the uh, SMT or multi-threading capability of my mo- motherboard turned on to take advantage of the multi-threading capability of the CPU. In essence, doubling the number of virtual CPUs that the system sees. Yeah, so that's that's like uh, hyper-threading um, is what Intel called it. I forget what... Uh simultaneous multi-threading uh smt just refers to having multiple cores um the the uh, the idea of hyper threading is like not all of those cores it's not exactly what amd is doing um i i must point out though that really ken just picked that command line because he wanted to show off his shiny new processor (laughs) and all 16 cores that it has i do have a question though we know eight cores that it has well okay so With the new AMD processors, they you get deep into processor theory with this and like how much a core is and, and how much hyper threading is going on. They actually have 16 cores, but only eight full cores and then eight like mini cores that stack up. Yeah, it's it's weird. Multi modern multiprocessing is weird. <laughs> Good rough. But Ken the one question I have is why are you using obsolete uh, abandoned software? NeoFetch? Yes, NeoFetch. Because I haven't <laughs> found a good replacement yet. <laughs> you got one to suggest? 
Well, We've, well, we did some. suggest we did suggest it on the show when we talked about it. I mean, you probably got all kinds of viruses now with that old thing. <laughs> <laughs> Better get Kaspersky on it. Oh, yeah. thankfully that's not how that works. <laughs> oh goodness! All right, I've got a uh, I've got a super quick tip. Um, I had to do some work on my network here in the past couple of days. I was given some new IP addresses, and uh, I was unable to get into my guest router because the IP address disappeared that it was trying to use. Well, I've also got some IPv6, so I said, oh, I can just go to my web browser and punch in the IPv6 address, and certainly I can pull it up. And if you don't know, when you go to type an IPv6 address into your web browser's URL, it runs a Google search on the text instead of interpreting it as an IPv6 address. And so if, so quick tip, surround it in square brackets. It is square, open square bracket, then the IPv6 address, and then close square bracket. And that will force your web browser to actually see it as an IP address. So super quick for me, not really on the command line, but if you need it, you need it. <laughs> Good tip. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, I think that is the show, and uh, we've covered a lot of ground. I'm going to let each of the guys close it out, get the last word, plug anything they want to. We're going to start with Rob. All right. As always, come connect with me, uh, robertpcampbell.com. As it says right down there, uh, on there you can find my LinkedIn, Twitter, or X, Mastodon, or a place to donate coffees to me so I can... uh, drink coffees and um yeah come connect with me say hi and that's all i got (laughs) i am i am humored by the number of people that are like begrudgingly returning to x it's like okay fine maybe we overreacted a little bit we'll come back to twitter (laughs) well i'm not saying i overreacted a little bit but uh somebody somebody linked me and i thought i should be there (laughs) okay okay i can't go back (laughs) <laughs> I never had Twitter. Ken. Well, maybe it's time. Uh, go ahead and, and uh, get get your plug in, Ken. Well, I just wanted to share a link to the Destination Linux podcast uh, inter- interview with Thomas Kreider, also known as Glorious Agrol. That does sound that does sound interesting. I've I have followed the glorious egg roll for a while, and uh, he does some cool stuff. So I have to check. It's only out. an hour and a half long. Ah, uh, that's nothing. We go longer than that on this show all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jeff. Like now, <laughs> you like now? Yeah. Um, How did your ride my, go? It went wonderful. So my my ending note today has nothing to do with Linux, uh, and no poetry. Sorry, I got something else to talk about. I did, and I have a link in the show notes, ride 1K in a day. So I did, and it's been a bucket list item for me. I rode 1,000 miles in 24 hours on my motorcycle. Nice. So I we went from Idaho Falls in Idaho all the way north to the Canadian border. We didn't cross the border, but it was a beautiful ride through the mountains. It was wonderful uh, and wound up getting a certificate for it, and we... we supposedly i think we set a record because we had 16 motorcycles that did it all together and we started with 16 and we ended with 16 and everybody made it and everybody was safe so it was a it was a wonderful ride so awesome. that's that's why i missed i missed a, a show so a, a worthy, other, other than that a worthy oh, thing to be out doing <laughs> yes yes well it was uh, you know and it's like why would you do that well it's it, why do you climb the mountain it was there it's it's something i've always wanted to do so i did it and I'm happy I did, and I just love riding on a motorcycle. Yep, yep, very cool. So other than that, everyone have a great week, and I look forward to uh, seeing you next week. All right. Appreciate you guys being here. Uh, if you want to follow my work, there is, of course, over on Hackaday, we have Floss Weekly, which records, well, for the rest of this month, we're recording on Wednesdays, and we are actually about to move the recording to Tuesdays. And uh, if you were to go to the Floss Weekly YouTube page, you will find that our latest episode we actually uploaded with the video enabled. We're going to give that a try for a little while and see how that goes. So doing some upgrades over there. And then, of course, my security column goes live every Friday, Friday morning over Attack Day. Uh, 
lots of interesting stuff there because the world of security is hardly ever boring almost always something going on so you can follow that stuff there um and uh yeah that's pretty much it. If you really want to, throw a tip in the tip jar for me personally. It's over at buymeacoffee.com, and I use the the name J.P. Bennett there. Um, so feel free to look that up if you really think I've earned the tip. Other than that, um, if if you appreciate Twit, uh, <laughs> if you appreciate Twit being the host of the uh, the Untitled Linux Show, you can join the club. Let's see if I can. There we go. That's what I wanted. You got the QR code right there to get in on Club Twit, and that's it's just seven dollars a month. It's like a cup of coffee per month, and uh, it keeps Twit on the airwaves. And it's a way to show your support. We should appreciate it. And uh, yeah, think about that. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's about it. We appreciate everybody being here, and we will see you again next week on the Untitled Linux Show. Mm-hmm.